Hey everyone, so for, uh, for the record, it is 5 a.m. Central Standard Time on September 16, uh, you know, ostensibly 2020. I know it's been a while since I've made much of anything. Um, I do try to let you guys know, you know, uh, that I'm always working away, uh, usually through posts on the channel, but uh, I have been, and um, well, I'm going to share a, a little bit about what I've been doing and what kind of uh, results it's producing, um, and then I want to talk to you a bit about kind of a a mix bag of of things, yeah, mostly having to do with prophecy, uh, prophecy geography. Um, basically, taking a lot of things that that we've we've sort of been raised and and indoctrinated to to view as. Um, is very distant and very removed from us. For anybody who's, let's say, gotten at least a pretty good amount of the way into uh, the examination of, let's say, mainstream accepted history, uh, when overlaid onto Bible prophecy and Bible timeline, Bible events, peoples. Um, you should have noticed that there, uh, in order to, to overlay what is currently accepted as mainstream history, geography, peoples, and so on, it, that it's very strained to do that. Um, those things, those reasons alone, give critics of the Bible ample material to uh, to to attack. It gives them uh, an army of straw men to go after, and if we don't understand that there's a clear difference between what the Bible is telling us as far as <clears throat> history, peoples, and geography, and we don't extricate ourselves from a modern accepted history, which the evidence for a great deal of this is so bad, weak, spurious in many cases. Then, you know, we're going to we're going to fall victim to people who are uh, very sophisticated, who may uh, know this contrived system of history geography, and peoples uh, very well. It, it would be like trying to um, argue doctrine against somebody who was extremely well-versed <clears throat> in, in modern, accepted, Protestant, evangelical, um, systematic theology and hermeneutics, you see. It'd be like um, debating a James White if you weren't equipped with the, the knowledge and understanding of why his presuppositions are either wrong or simply don't have the body of strong evidence which he would make you believe he has. Now, I don't know if that's James White, 
or James Weiss. But <clears throat> that's for another time. So let me let me start with the book. <clears throat> I've been talking about the book for a long time. And I've been working on the book for a long time. It is a mammoth project. It it it's not simply about taking an accepted Bible translation or many and and finding the the most suitable passages and translations and so forth um, and comparing them and making cases y you can't you can't do that when it comes to geography as well as history when we're talking about the Bible when it comes to any subject okay we can we can talk about the the subject of systematic theology as well you you can't really hope that you're going to make a case that is rock solid concrete stuff that let's say a, a very um a very competent sophist um say uh try to give you a good example here who is that guy um he's a rabbi of course now i can't think of his name anyways <laughs> if you're not making a case from the language down at its roots if you're not digging down to that ground level and you're not understanding um, the whys and the hows, if, if you don't have an intimate relationship with the nuts and bolts of the language and, and how it's used and how it's been misused by the Masoretes and all the rabbis, before and since, then you can, you can make, you can still make a case for um, an alternative geography. But the problem is, somebody's going to come along who is very skilled in the current accepted mainstream system of Masoretic and the current accepted mainstream system of history and geography, let's say, as it's been mostly handed down from uh, very spurious sources like Josephus, for instance. And they're just going to start hammering away at these points you're making if you don't know all of them in the most primal I'm sure there's a a better word in sort of a I said intimate in you got to make this stuff so much a part of you um <clears throat> that it's just second nature that understanding the points that you're making they're second nature and what that requires is such uh such in-depth study and such a knowledge of the material that it's akin to bathing in it now i have already completed a good like 6 or 7 chapters, some more lengthy than others. And when the book is done and I publish it, <clears throat> I will also be including the three articles that I wrote that I made audio presentations of. The Patriarchs, Their Livestock, The Land, The Land of Amory, 
and Euphrates, a problem of geography. However, I will be rewriting those so that just in the sense that when I originally published those articles and as they stand at the obreproject.info website, project with a K, um, they actually, they use Obrey characters written from left to right as, as I always do with Obrey, but the characters themselves. Now, um, unfortunately, I think it was a bit of, um, either naivete or, or just not really considering the fact that even those characters as they stand, as much as many of them are so similar to, to our English uh, letters, um, it still made the documents very hard for, for anybody to just pick up and read, which I'm not doing that in the book. Um, in the book, everything... Uh, that is in Obery is going to be presented in a, a simple phonetic way. And there will, there will be a very simple phonetic key to it. So anybody will be able to, to read it, pronounce it, and all of them will have the, uh, uh, the Strong's, uh, Hebrew coded numbers with them. So it, anybody should be able to pick this up, read it, and understand what I'm saying. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of differences in it because it's just not as simple as, say, like a Commons Beaumont would would try to present it. Um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, there there were all kinds of problems present in, uh, for instance, Common Bo Beaumont's presentation um, and the bits and pieces of other people's presentations who have raised questions at least or, or raised doubts about um, the biblical narrative uh, when compared and contrasted to current mainstream accepted timelines and geography. So um, after writing a, a number of I think, uh, really good um, knockout style chapters. Real heavy content, each one. Um, any one of them individually, just like those three papers, any one of them individually should cast an extraordinary amount of doubt on what we've been told was the location of the Bible. Um, what happens is a lot of times when I, I get to a new chapter and I, I already have these ideas sketched out. Um, I've based a lot of that on just my reading and studying so far. So I got to the point where I really needed to address directions. And the first off the difference in the way that that we look at per, uh directions today our perceptions of directions today versus what the bible well, i guess it maybe it's fair to say the bible's perceptions of directions and, and it's not the same <clears throat> you see one of the problems, uh, I'm just going to give you one and, uh, you know, leave the rest, but, but here's a good example. Okay. And this is required by the way, because there's so many, there's so many factors. First off, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, I'll, I'll bring this document up. Okay. There's somewhere in the neighborhood. Of, let's just talk about raw words that are translated as one of the cardinal directions. Okay, so we'll say north. If you see the word north in the Bible, it could be coming from the word Mizrim, not to be mistaken with Mitzrim, Mizrim, or Tzpun, or Tzpuni. It's, it's mostly always going to be Tzpun or Tzpuni, okay? But what I'm saying is those three words are translated as north. If you see east in the Bible, <clears throat> that could be from one of uh, a number of words. It could be from the word harasut, 
mutza, mazra, usually with eshamash, uh, eshamash being the sun. Mazra, eshamash, or just mazra by itself, and sometimes zera, asim, eshamash. It's a, a descriptive. Uh, zera, uh, meaning like a spreading over, okay, or spreading of. There's kadim, kadem, kadme, kadmun, or kadmani. All those different words, those are different listings in Strong's, all translated as east. South, you would have derum, hader, yam, which is kind of crazy, but yam. The reason being, yam is the word for sea, and it's often also uh, translated as west. Yamin or midbar. <clears throat> now, yamin is an interesting one too because that's actually the right hand, and the assumption that comes along with that is that um, it would just be a given that facing forward would be to face east. Uh, however, that needs to be proved, that assumption. Um, to be quite honest with you, there are passages where uh, words like uh, to ascend Something like uh, ol, uh, to ascend, or, or a form of ol, ole, sometimes is actually referring to going northward. And sometimes words like rad, rad roots, or yirad, urad, narad, uh, are used when I know for a fact that someone is going southward. Now, if that's the case, and that's the typical orientation because, let's be honest, that's exactly the way we still think about it. If we were to look at a map, we would consider, you know, straight ahead of us or, or up north and down south. So from that orientation or that perspective, right hand, the right hand would be east, not south. So that's something that has to be proven. <clears throat> then also the word midbar, which is actually the wilderness, but it's translated as south one time just because it happened to work for these people's narrative. That's why they did that. There's Negeb. Um, Negeb, not like the Negev desert in Palestine, um, is the most used translated word south. And then there's timon. Um, this word, if it were a verb, would be, uh, it would share a similar root, of course, with um, Yemen, the, the right hand, from like Benjamin, um, son of my right hand, Benjamin. Uh, the strange thing about both of those words, too, is that their root is uh, it's either yum or me, yum being the C. <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, anyways, now then there's west. Uh, west besides north is the one with the fewest words that are translated as west. You have you either have yum, which is of course C. You have uh, mabua. Um, Mabua or bua it comes from the root ba, and it means to go in uh, or come in, but it always has the sense of in, you know, uh, as opposed to coming out like tsa. And it's often found with, again, eshemash, the sun. Or then there's maorib, and it's got a triglyph root, orib, which is most often translated as evening. We'll first see it in Genesis 1, the evening and the morning. Oreb u bakr, the evening and the morning. So that's a big set of words that first off have to be understood as far as what they're describing. And also they have to be proven. This has to be done because there are there are serious uh, directional anomalies, 
And again, there is a perspective problem between the way that the Israelite of the, the, the time, that time, would understand these things based on the way that Yahweh intended them to be understood and why he designed this language as he did and implemented it and kept it alive for so many millennia as he did. So I was going to tell you one of the uh, one of the real problems that I hope will help to illustrate to you why there is such a, a disconnect, a great gulf between the way that the Israelite of this time would have understood these things, directions, um, as opposed to the way we do today. A lot of um, um, hermetic ideas and pseudoscience has contributed to the problems we have with understanding. So, the, the pseudoscience of it all tells us that we are on a moving ball and that it has a, a magnetic north pole. Now, whether you want to believe that or not it is irrelevant right now as far as directions, okay? You can believe in that the the you know the spinning ball or you can believe in the flat model either way doesn't matter concerning what i'm going to tell you as far as direction or understanding it okay so the way that we understand north today is we either have our magnetic north or true north and they're somewhat near but both of them point to about the middle of whether it's magnetic or geographical the, the middle top of a globe. Now, on a flat model, it would be, again, the, the middle center. Geographically, middle center would be true, and middle center magnetically would be the, the magnetic north pole on either model. But, <clears throat> so, what's weird, and, and where are our mental um, block uh, comes from with looking at it the way that they do today as compared to biblically is the fact that today we would think north let's say if we're in North America and we're looking at a prophecy about somebody coming from far north okay well in North America all we have is Canada to the north of us, and then, of course, the, uh, the cold waters of the, the North Sea, which they tell us are mostly frozen and innavigable, which I've been actually uh, reading through a book on that, the Annian Seaway Theory. Um, it's totally controlled opposition, but it was written quite a long time ago, and there are good extracts to have from it because um, I believe that that was one of the most used seaways always. Um, I, I don't want to say up until uh, a few hundred years ago, though I don't know if it got colder or less navigable, but in general it had been a, a highly used seaway. And let's be honest, what do we all know about the North? Not a lot. It seems like especially since uh, Flat Earth Theory was, was heavily pushed, um, we, we know more about the South than the North, honestly. That's, the North is still so uh, obscure to us. But, um, so we would kind of stop there. We would consider either geographic or magnetic North as our stopper. So if we saw a prophecy about somebody coming from the, you know, the far North, we're going to immediately think, well, he couldn't be talking to, um, not in Bible perspective, because in Bible perspective, a direction, it doesn't stop at a pole that, that man has dictated is the stopping point. It's simply, imagine it as an arrow in a direction. Okay, so ma no matter if you you like the ball concept or or the flat concept, you put yourself in North America. You put yourself 
anywhere. And tsipun being the only, uh, the only direction fitting for north, and there's ample evidence for why it would be north. North. Straight up. Okay? Straight up towards the center. But it doesn't stop there. Y you understand? If you look at a flat map, which I have one. I have one in maps. I, I, I didn't figure that I would use this or I would have it ready. Um, but I have one in here. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have um, one of Mercator's old maps. Uh, So-called North Pole maps. And, and I'll just open it because this isn't just an audio. I'm, I'm making it with video too, but um, nobody has to watch it. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to try to be descriptive enough. So, okay, over here to the, uh, the upper left is uh, the North America landmass area, okay? So let's say we're here in the North American landmass area, and north is straight towards the center here, okay? So if we go straight towards the center, and just keep that arrow going, just keep it going. You don't stop there at the center. Just keep it going. If it's far north, you just keep it going. And what you end up hitting is you end up hitting areas, parts of northern Asia. Okay? So the areas of, of Russia, Finland, Norway, and down into Europe. And as a matter of fact, if we were on the west coast of North America and you went straight across, you would be all in this area of Northern Europe and Scandinavia. That, that would just be a straight shot across, is what I'm saying. So that's one of the problems. It's one of the uh, gaps between what we perceive as directions and what the Bible's actually telling us. So that's where I'm at the book. And... Um, I'm really hoping that this uh, this chapter on directions and all of the the extra work that I have to do in order to write it and to absolutely understand it on the the most basic level won't take <laughs> terribly too much longer. Uh, one of the things that's helping tremendously, and this is a document that I not completed but got to a very uh, good, workable point just recently. I've spent a great deal of time now on this. This is actually a table of Obery simple biglyph roots. It is extremely valuable for study. Now, it's not done because there are various notes uh, that I'll be making on these different entries. And then to the very right of this table, I will be um, breaking down the individual glyphs and how they act together as a pair. Now, the, the real value in this is that I have gathered um, so far, and you got to figure I've got 86, 8,700 plus entries I'm working with. So I may have missed some. But what I've done is I've gathered so far all of the entries from Strong's, uh, no matter how they're presented, that in the text it is provable that they are a certain simple biglyph root. Give you an example like um, Strong's H1854 is listed as Dekak. And you can find it clearly as just the simple biglyph duck, D, Q, duck. Um, so you find enough of those, like in the case of duck, I've got one, two, three, I've got three entries. Um, I give the, the Masoretic appearance of that entry, I give the uh, phonetic pronunciation of the ovary, I give the Strong's number so it can be. 
uh, double clicked, copy pasted into whatever the software is that you're using for concordance or whatever and check it out. And I give most of its appearances. So usually you can tell right away if it's taking on a noun form or a verb form. Now those are not the only forms, but those are the two main forms that you'll find words in. And you'll see this repeated over and over and over again. In the next column, I give you the type of speech that it would be classified as, as English speakers, okay? The column after that is going to be cognates used to reinforce that root. The next column is going to be any various notes that I need to make about these entries. The last column is going to be where I take, let's say there's three entries on doc. I will, um, all of these cells will be merged into one cell. And like I said, there will be the breakdown of the individual glyphs and then the simple root and how all of them work together. Now, I just started doing that part of this and it produces excellent results. I'm going to give you a quick uh, example and then I'm going to move on to some of the things I wanted to talk about on prophecy and geography. So for instance, I have three entries of the simple biglyph root pun, P-N, pun. Um, the first one is um, designated as a noun, and it's translated as corner only a couple of times. However, it has a cognate of pene, which is translated corner or chief, like a leader of a, a people or a tribe. And that's translated a lot of times. You'll see that quite a bit. So it has a lot of evidence. The next pun is uh, a conjunction, and it's used as lest. Or unless uh, and a few other ways but mostly you'll see lest or unless that sort of conjunction the last one a verb and it's mostly translated as turn look or regard now I haven't filled in all of the relevant cognates yet um, but I did go through them yesterday a great deal <clears throat> Now here's what I found. You've got those three different entries. One, a noun, that's oftentimes translated as corner or chief. The other one, a conjunction, that's used as lest or unless. And the other, a verb, uh, for like turn, look, or regard. Uh, so the thing is this. The P is representative of an edge or a lip. The N is representative of a projection, a flowing to, from. That's why the N is used at the front of so many verbs. So, um, face or to face or projection of either an edge or a corner. Now, it is the face of a man, land, or a thing, and it's also the projection of. Thus, why sometimes it seems suitable for corner. It acts as a conjunction. Now, get this. And this is why there should always be a consistency in these roots, how they're used and what they are. This is really interesting. It acts as a conjunction in the sense of facing or projecting the former clause to the latter clause. And we'll see it used early on in, um, for instance, Genesis 3, when Yahweh says he's going to guard the tree of life and he drives man um, from the garden. He says that he, he will guard the tree of life pun, lest man should eat of it now and live forever. It follows a former clause and faces it to the latter clause, cause and effect. It faces, turns, gives you direction from the one to the other. That's how this should theoretically work, and that's how it is working. So, 
I'm not going to post this document yet at the Obery Project website on resources simply because it's not done, or at least done enough. But for anybody who wants to do this kind of serious study, um, and you want to look at these things, and you want to start seeing what kind of comparisons you can make, just let me know. Um, you can contact me through the Obery Project uh, website. And I always, I always put information on contact, donations, all of that, in every description. So you'll be able to find it there. Now, and I'll, I'll send you a copy of this. I'll send you a LibreOffice copy. I'll send you a PDF. Whatever uh, document type would work best for you, let me know. LibreOffice, um, it, you can import that if you have Microsoft Office. I can send you the LibreOffice file. It'll import it. Okay, so no, no worries there. So I want to go from that to talking a bit about this um, prophecy, prophecy fulfilled scene in our own time, and um, maybe various peoples and goodies, kind of bits and pieces uh, all surrounding that. Okay, so most of what I'm going to tell you about biblically, uh, I don't have the time to fully read the passages to you because then the video would become extremely long. So um, I'm going to leave it up to you to go and read these and, and consider a lot of things I'm saying. Okay. The scope of world history with a central focus on Israel is laid out in two different ways between Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 2 is the dream Nebuchadnezzar has and the statue and the interpretation by Daniel. And then Daniel chapter 7 is, and I'm going to assert this with some backup, is not is sort of a reinterpretation of two. And then we see more of a fulfillment of that in Revelation. But no one's going to really understand Revelation if you don't understand those scopes of history we find in Daniel. And it's not only two and seven we find them. <clears throat> we find it in eight through twelve as well. And there's massive amounts of detail in those chapters, huge amounts of detail. So in, in Daniel chapter 7, it's essentially a, a retelling, but instead of um, types of precious metals uh, to the point of non-precious metals uh, in the feet and toes, it's actually iron and, and clay. It's a relatively decent translation of these things, but um, <clears throat> it's a mix of two things that aren't supposed to mix, and so they don't mix. Um, and then we get we get a bit of a view in that, also in Daniel 7, when we see the fourth beast. There's a fourth beast, and it's not like these other beasts, which is an identifiable, uh, identifiable animal. Um, this is something not readily identifiable and, and kind of in the same way as we see with these legs and then this um, these feet of a mixture of, of two elements that don't mix. That fourth beast is another representation of that. What we get in Daniel 7 is a far broader sweep than what we get in Revelation 12 and 13, which is far more focused and detailed. But in Daniel chapter 7, that fourth beast, you see it has ten horns. These ten horns represent these, uh, these seats of power. And the way it's described is, he looked, he saw these ten horns. And then as he was looking at the horns, this, there came up 
this little horn from among the ten. Before whom, this little horn, there were three of the former horns uprooted. And then it goes on. <clears throat> Here's, of course, again, the thing is, Daniel chapter 2, verse 4, through Daniel chapter 7, the last verse in 7, all of that is in Aramaic, not Obri, or Arami, not Obri. Now, the screwed up thing about this is that as far as biblical Arami goes, biblical Arami is represented with the Hebrew character, the Jewbrew character, um, and so it's not even represented in what we know of as Aramaic characters today. So, our lexicography and what we have to pull from and compare is something that we would have to go more to rabbinic writings to see how they use Aramaic, because that's what they always used in their writings before they started using standard Hebrew as a standard. The reason for that is because these people, known as Jews, are a, uh, they are, a, <clears throat> they're a mishmash. They're a mishmash of, of, of Kenim or Kenites, uh, the, the tribe descendants of Cain, and um, Edomites, Adumi, uh, descendants of Esau, Edom, and, and Moab, and, and Ammon, uh, and along with the, uh, the Separuim, where, we, where they get Sephardic from, um, and also the Babli, uh, people from Babel, people from uh, Oilam, so on and so forth. All of this is relayed in 2 Kings 17, where the big move came in, where they started moving all of these various peoples in, and how they adopted um, the laws of Yahweh so that they'd stop being killed because he was sending beasts to kill these people because they weren't keeping his laws in his land. And what they did was they turned that into a religion, a religion that combined all of their despicable and pagan ways with his word and his law. And they started claiming him as their Aliyim, their God, from that time forward. This was, of course, the big problem that uh, Ezra and Nehemiah encountered with them when they came back to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple because they wanted to say that they wanted to do it too because their Aliyim was our Aliyim. And we had to tell them, but no, it is not for you to do these things. You're not appointed. You're not part of the holy seed. And yes, that term is used in Nehemiah. So, <clears throat> anyways, you get down over the years quite a long ways. And we have this people who come up amongst these horns that exist on this fourth beast. Now, what we've been told, no matter if you're being told this by the futuristic school of prophecy, the preteristic, and so on and so forth, all of their explanations for this are either so weak with no real evidence, or say the strongest one out there is still the historicist perspective in which they would say that all of this, of course, revolves around the Catholic Church and Protestant Christianity and blah, 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 and that the horns are actually these, uh, these Germanic tribes and that um, they were having wars with ancient Rome and then when the papacy took power, uh, they destroyed these three tribes, the, the Vandals and the, uh, the Ostrogoths, and um, so on, okay? That's the strongest one that any of them have. And again, their proof is spurious 
at best. They all still argue so much over details because there's not much at all. However, there is an interpretation of that that not only is within our own time involving history that at least the structure thereof is attainable and has a great deal of evidence for. Now, when many of us Israelites, our fathers, migrated from their homeland through displacement, heavily displacement, some of course um, simply volunteered to go and migrate out, just like the Noahites, the sons of Noah. They, they voluntarily migrated away from the land. That is the land of Amory. When we were displaced, eventually, mostly let's just bring it up to the time of post Yusho, post Christ, and the great cataclysms and wars and terrible things that happened not long after that he warned about in Matthew 24. So then there would have been another large displacement of our people. Judgment. Judgment on what Judahites and Israelites were left still in the land. And there was a great deal of judgment on the land itself. It became a land of... Um, well, I guess in, in, in sort of uh, modern English terms, uh, a land of reproach and hissing, a land that even passers-by would say was cursed for a very long time. Nobody came around. So before then, those that were left of us were uh, again transported elsewhere. Elsewhere being to the regions of the kingdoms being occupied by other Noahites. You see, the third kingdom that would come up, we knew of the first two. The first one, Daniel said clearly in Daniel 2, was Babel and Nebuchadnezzar. The kingdom of the Kashdim, not the Chaldeans, the Kashdim. The second one we know was the Madi and Parasi. The third one is named as Iun. Now, Iun, or John, or Ivan, depending on how it would be uh, translated into whatever various languages were spawned from the Noahites. Um, this one comes along afterwards and really takes over all of the lands and kingdoms that had been possessed by. Uh, the kingdom of Paris and Madi. Now, we don't have any evidence other than secular history that that kingdom of Yun was taken over, translated into this kingdom of Rome. And as a matter of fact, when you look at it very closely, those two kingdoms that were told of by secular history being the kingdom spurious history, the kingdoms of Greece and Rome, being world kingdoms. I'm not saying those people never had kingdoms or never had high culture. I'm saying what we've been told, what we've been told about them ruling the world and when they were supposedly the world rulers is what's in question. Now, <clears throat> this kingdom was likely the Yun, the third kingdom, was likely the kingdom that was still presiding over all the peoples and lands that before that Paris and Madi had. Now, in your Bible, you'll see it as Persia and Mede, or the Medes. Okay, but it is phonetically in Obery, Paris, and Madi. And I'm going to point out some interesting things specifically about Paris right now, uh, or 
coming up. So we have no proof other than a term in the New Testament, Rama, which literally could just be, since there are so many words inserted in here that are just um, Obery transliterations, phonetic Obery transliterations, just like Gehenna. That's just from Ge Enum. But anyways, that word, the root of that word, having to do with um, exaltation or an oppression, Roma. Okay, that's how they were referred to. And it was likely very general in, in that sense. It doesn't change the fact that those people likely came from this Iyun. Iyun being a son of Japheth, Yepet, and one of his sons being Tarshish. What I'm telling you is that based on everything I, I know, I've researched what I know about the Bible, and what I know that accepted mainstream history tells us, contrasted with a lot of various theories that are being posited by um, Tatarian researchers, that that third great kingdom that reigned for quite a long time was likely what people are calling in 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 one way in one way what they're calling tartaria in the sense that it was a kingdom that was likely a conglomeration type of kingdom i don't know how much about multiculti but at least the conglomeration of noahites now, I don't think that that's the full expression of what people see as Tartaria. I think a lot of people that that look into that, what they're seeing oftentimes is signs of the Noahites all around the world, because that's just the kind of people we are and have always been. We travel the world. We sail. We find ways to move across land and air and sea. Always. So why wouldn't there be fingerprints of our high civilization, high culture, high architecture everywhere? Okay. However, that third kingdom was eventually translated into a sort of fourth kingdom that wasn't as clearly defined and recognizable, like the third. This is that last beast with these, these ten horns, because it has these, all these various seats of power. So when you want to look down all that we know and, and have as, as pretty strong history, the most likely candidate that will emerge is the, the kings of Europe, which, <clears throat> even though there is ample evidence that the, who are called the Germanic tribes, did overthrow or displace a great deal of the people that were once the inhabitants of, of Europe. In, in the areas of Ashkenaz, the various Germans displaced them to a large degree. However, I believe their kings and royalty held sway and power over them for a long time. They did this through the same kind of methods that the Jews are using to this day and have for a few centuries of bringing in various different kinds of peoples to often oppress us. They displaced uh, Ashkenaz in the area of Germany. That's why it's still called Ashkenaz. It's not because the Germans are of that line of people. It's because that was the name traditionally. You see the, the Brits, the Celts, the Welsh displaced Picts 
which more than likely are the reason that you will find people that aren't like the rest of us, Germanics, Celts, and Anglos, uh, in those areas of the British Isles, that they're not like us. They're, uh, they're different in form and behavior. A lot of them are likely called pikeys, picked pikey. But anyways, I digress. Those kings of Europe who were likely not the same as us because of the ways they ruled over us, um, those were the ten horns. And the little horn that came up amongst them, I think we all know to this day who that is. Because when he comes up amongst them, get it? Because he lived amongst them. He didn't have his own separate kingdom. It came up amongst them. And it uprooted three. Now, what three are the most important, pivotal uprootings that we would have in our own time? The first would be the revolution and regicide affected in Cromwell's England. You see, the Jews through Manasseh ben Israel and other powerful political rabbis, bankers, financers, financed Cromwell and the Puritans, which the Puritans were nothing but absolute Shabbos Goy uh, Jewish proselytes. Cromwell, I don't even believe, was white. He was probably one of these people that called him dark nobility. Some people have accused him of being uh, a mulatto. You look at his death mask, and he certainly doesn't look like a Germanic. Likely, whatever the black nobility was, or Pictish, or something, Cromwell and his Puritans affected not only the regicide of who was uh, currently the, the authentic reigning monarch, who, who had a claim to the throne, but afterwards and during, I mean, fomented and carried out the bloodiest civil war in English history. So what happens? Tons and tons of English die. And those seats of influence and power are replaced with their people, the Jew, the so-called Jew. And then afterwards, they went about massacres amongst the Celts. Okay, that's horn one. Horn two, the late 1700s, France, Louis XVI regicide. Also, at the same time and following, the greatest, bloodiest, not revolution, civil war, murdering scores and scores and scores of people, the people of France. And their system you see, the system of intelligentsia, people of influence and rule, entirely changed in that so-called revolution. It was an uprooting. And the last, the early 20th century Russia, Tsar Nicholas and his family, followed by the bloodiest massacre of people, of common people of Russia, um, which I believe is named in Ezekiel 38 and 39 as Tarshish. Maybe just because of the land, maybe because those are the descendants of Tarshish. Anyways, and then 
many ethnic Germans that had been brought in by Catherine living in the Ukraine, and Ukrainians. Three horns. Three horns. Uprooted. Now, after this happens, that little horn goes about making war on the saints. Now, when you see saints, that's speaking of Yahweh's Israel. From the time of this uprooting forward, the wars waged by these countries, in large part, were not only against its own people, okay, because we have England and Ephraim, they warred against their own people, and they warred against the Celts, those of the Galut, the Celts, the Gauls. They warred against the people of France. Now, France warred against other Germanic peoples. And then, in her own time, after that third horn was uprooted in Russia, three of those powers, Russia, under the banner of the Soviet Union, England, and France all warred against Germany. Germany just being an expression of all the various tribes of people living there. And when I say Germany and Germanics, it's not that I, it's not that I don't believe um, that the Danes are Danites or that the, the Dutch are a Germanic tribe. Dutch and Deutsch, or that the English are the Ephraimites, or that the Celts are the, the Menasites, uh, Manasseh. And th there's reasons for this. I'm not just pulling this out of the air, okay? One of the reasons that I believe that the Celts are heavily um, Menashites is, first off, um, they share a close relationship in, in culture and um, physicality and people type as the English, but they weren't, they're not as, um, as numerous and populous or spread their influence as much. Um, however, they, with their very small numbers, or much smaller, of course, than Ephraim or England, were still extremely effective warriors. Now, we'll see this exact same thing if we just pay attention in the Bible. It was the same thing between Ephraim and Manasseh. And specifically, who? The sub-tribe of Manasseh coming from the family Makir, the Makir. And I posit to you that that is why we get so many names from the Scots and Irish. Mech. <clears throat> so, instead of this extremely important prophecy from Daniel 7, Daniel 2 and 7, and then uh, more detailed portions of it in Revelation 12 and 13, instead of it being in this, in this far distant past, we're so disconnected from with such little solid material for we've seen it happen in our own time the last 500 years of history are relatively solid there's been a lot that has been of course uh, fooled with you know the Jew has hidden himself um, they have very much done a lot of work to disconnect all of these events from what they really are and who they were really against. So, that's one thing, and I think that's very important to keep in mind when you're considering prophecy. That little horn is exactly who I just said it is. Those three horns it uprooted are exactly who I just described they were. Those 
are three of the most important events in what we can call modern history in general. Now don't tell me the Bible did not prophesy of them. And then that little horn controlling that beast, just like the prostitutes does in Revelation 16, makes war on the saints. But there's good news. Like Daniel 7.22, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom up upon earth, which shall be diverse, <laughs> diversity from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth. Really? Hmm. Do you suppose that little horn in their kingdom has devoured the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces, like balkanizing? And the ten horns out of this kingdom, they were ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. He shall be diverse from the first. He wasn't like them. He wasn't like them, was he? And he knows he's not. They're racially diverse. They're not the same. And he said, look, when I said that I didn't think that necessarily those kings were from the same stock as Israelites, because of what they did, because so many of them would bring these people into their countries to, to rob and steal from their own subjects because they were afraid to do it under the banner of Christianity. Okay, I have my serious doubts that those kings came from the stock of Israel. Some of them, maybe. But the whole point is this, whether they did or didn't, whether they were from, you know, Japheth or another tribe of Shem or what, they were still racially similar. And they were still not like this other group that came forward, which is, is just an absolute mamzer creature. Okay? He was diverse from those other kings, and you know they are. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. Does that sound familiar? And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And think what? What does he think? To change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, a times, and a dividing of time. I'm not absolutely positive that's what most of the historicists have told us, you know, like 1260 years or something like that. I'm not sure of that because of the different words that are used for times. Okay, so I'm not sure about that yet, but it would be for a, a, a long, uh, a a long period of time, but the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it until the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Now you check that with Ezekiel 38 and 39, <clears throat> and after this incidence of Gog, which means the top of the land of Magog. So they come from the land of Magog. Magog being another son of Yepet, Japheth. That they would bring all these peoples to surround the saints. And that it would be a situation. Th this was after we were back in the land that the Bible took place in, living in a civilization of unwalled villages. And you know that's not Palestine. And they would surround us. And there would be an event that would be so decisive 
and catastrophic carried out by the hand of Yahweh himself. That he says, never again will my people turn from me from that point forward. Prophecy is very real, it's very accurate, and it is being fulfilled in our own days. Now, <clears throat> this may be how clear and how stark these things are, may be the reason that some of these extreme historical revisionists like Fomenko and people along those lines are really just trying to take a wrecking ball to all history. As opposed to the things about history that they should be taking a wrecking ball to. This is why the biggest names out there are not only not naming the Jew as the one who has been fooling around with the records, limiting what gets printed, burning down libraries, buying up all the publishers, controlling the narrative entirely. These people who say they're giving you truth, they're not naming them? And they have names like John Levi, Martin Lidke, and anyone who goes along with them, because they're not picking out the problems and naming who is at the core. That's the problem with the extreme historical revisionist. These people, you have to chicken and bone hard, very, very cautiously and watchfully. Now, there was just a couple of things I was going to mention because it, 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 because it is interesting. And these aren't, these aren't absolutely solid, but they're, they're just some things to chew on, okay? Now, <clears throat> Paris. I've told you, this is the name that they always want to translate as Persia and then try to say that that's the Iranians, okay? Now, I'm not going to say that the Iranians don't possibly have Caucasian blood in them, or various uh, Indians don't. Like I told you, the Noahites have been traveling the world from not long after the flood thereof of Noah. And even before. So, of course, they've been around. And we know for a fact that a lot of our people have mixed heavily with other peoples. But that does not make Iran the Paris of the Bible. They can call themselves whatever they want. It doesn't make it so. They can believe they was Kangs, and it doesn't make it so. Now, is there something to the fact that they have so much... Uh, Noahite blood. I'm sure there is. But it simply doesn't make them the Paris of the Bible. In fact, I would posit to you that it is absolutely uncanny. And feel free to, to delve in much deeper than myself, because I don't have the time to, to go as deep into some of these things as maybe I would like. Why so many places along the coast of northern mainland Europe bear the phonetic root, Paris? What do I mean? There's Prussia, the area of Prussia. There is the area of Frisia. When you see an F, it's a P, Frisia. And do I even need to mention Paris? Where was Paris to come from in Bible prophecies when Jeremiah was prophesying against the king of Babel? From the north. 
from the north. A kingdom would come and destroy Babel from the north, and Babel was prophesied to come from the north, because Babel was north of Canaan. Remember what I told you earlier about directions from the far north. If you follow North America all the way across a flat map, you end up in the regions of Scandinavia, Northern Europe, or the area that we would consider as West Russia, Scandinavia, Northern Europe. So, were the Parsi, that kingdom, very much like ourselves? Of course they were. Of course they were. Have we fought amongst ourselves, us all being Noahites, um, through most of our history? Of course we have. The greatest wars in the world have been wars amongst ourselves. Of course they have. Are we and the people in the Bible very much similar in a lot of ways? Yes. Now, what is it about the Jew that is so racially dissimilar? Well, first off, we're talking about the compilation or combination of a number of different peoples that had lived in the land of Canaan with us for a very, very long time. And also the combination of them intermingling themselves. Furthermore, perhaps with this people that most would look to as Khazars. Essentially, if you combine and combine and combine and combine, combine the, combine the seed of Cain with the seed of Ishmael, with the seed of Esau, with the seed of Ammon and Moab, and so on and so on and so forth, and then combine that with the seed of the people that we call Khazar, which again, that whole story about them is so far removed and such little material from it. Um, how much of that is accurate, how much isn't, I don't know. But you combine with, with their seed, because we don't know of them living any other way but among us, just like it says here in Daniel 7, from among those ten horns. And they've always lived among us. But they simply added to their seed, and they, they, they constantly do this. You know, with Tabatai Tzvi in the, in the 1600s, they did this. With the Turks, with Arabs. Look, that's the thing. They mix and 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 they mix. Some mix more heavily um, towards Noahites. Some mix more heavily towards um, Middle Easterners. Don't even want to call them Arabs. I mean, it's various different kinds of, of Middle Easterners. Some have mixed heavily with Africans, Chinese. Okay? And they are diverse. Um, so finally they mixed with what we would refer to as the Khazars and became solidified through their, um, you know, don't give them all the credit either. Yes, they, they have been far more tribal, uh, than we have for a long time and they've engendered too much individuality in us, um, individuality that's very destructive to us. But um, there is a reason that these things happen and why they've gained so much power and control. It's because Yahweh's given that to them. These things aren't happening, um, you know, on his watch. He's given that to them for a reason, for us for strengthening and perfecting and refining us. And if that involves persecution, then it does. He told us what would happen if we did not 
keep his law. So that's some real history. That's some history that you can overlay with the Bible narrative and really have something, as opposed to all of these other narratives, which we don't have we don't have any real substance um, for evidence of them being real that have been published and reproduced and pushed by the same little horn that did everything that I just described. What are you going to believe? So, with that, anyways, I'm an hour 20 in. That's basically about everything I want to talk about. So, great. Again, anybody who uh, who wants to take at that, uh, a look at that root list that I have so far, uh, send me an email and just request it. You know, tell me if you'd rather have it in a file that you can open up in Office or uh, a PDF, and, you know, and I'll send you either one. And that's the only thing. I, I uh, export these files typically as PDFs because that's what I post at the website. If you want it in some other file format, then you're going to have to have LibreOffice or Microsoft Office. And the OCX file I give you, Office will open. And Office will uh, will change for you. You can do that. Okay? So, uh, hopefully I'll be coming at you with, uh, with more stuff here real soon. Alright? So, everybody, take care.